remember, if you were here last week, you remember uh, Leroy mentioned that uh, how difficult it would be to have four wives. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, now, I completely agree with that. It would be terribly difficult. Having two wives would be really a struggle because they would be constantly going at it together. Having three wives would be trouble because they would gang up on each other, you know, and, and uh, there would be problems there. Having four wives would just almost be unbearable. If you're going to be polygamous, I think you have to do it like Solomon. Have 700 wives and 300 concubines. Then, see, you can just build a city way out there someplace, send them out there, and you never have to deal with them. But that's not the case with, uh, with uh, Jacob. Jacob had to live with these four women. Their names, of course, are Leah, Rachel, Bilhah, and Zilpah. Actually, uh, Bilhah and Zilpah were not wives. And they were concubine, but we'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, and the only one that Jacob actually loved was Rachel. So it is not too difficult to see that his family was filled with broken relationships. Now, I didn't really want to introduce today's message with a downer, but a quote comes to mind from, that fits this passage of Scripture from Thomas Hobbes. Thomas Hobbes, a philosopher, said, life, the life of man is, short, is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. So he's a very pessimistic kind of guy. He's a glasses half full kind of guy. Uh, but there's a sense in which our lives are filled with difficulties and struggles and broken relationships and heartaches that are separated by happy times and contentment. You know, it's a long string of difficulties separated by the happiness and the contentment. In this passage, we see that Jacob's family is filled with bitterness, envy, jealousy, resentment, deceit, betrayal, self, selfish pride, anger, regret, blame, and sorrow. So his, his family was a life that was filled, that could be called pessimistic. Almost sounds like the dust jacket of a modern novel. If you add robotic, robotic aliens, violence, and computer graphics, you'd have the makings of a blockbuster movie. But uh, this is what you find in the book of Genesis. You find people who are real, people who have problems. And even though the Bible was written thousands of years ago, especially the story of, of Jacob and the patriarchs, we find a genuine reflection of human nature as we see it in our, in our world today. So I'd like to share something I've shared before is a, a quote from my, one of my favorite non-Christian philosophers. Uh, one, of, one of my non-favorite, my favorite non-Christian philosopher said this, all things are full of iniquity and vice. More crimes are committed than can be remedied by force. A monstrous contest of wickedness is carried on daily. The lust of sin increases daily. The sense of shame diminishes, casting away all regard for what is good and honorable. Pleasure runs riot without restraint. Vice no longer hides itself. It stalks before all eyes. So public has iniquity become. So mightily does it flame up in all hearts that innocence is no longer rare. It has ceased to exist. And that's one of my favorite uh, quotes from philosophy because it describes the society in which we live today, in the 21st century. But it was written in 65 AD by the Roman philosopher Seneca. And writing about the same time as Seneca... The Apostle Paul put it this way. 
Romans chapter 1, verse 25. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Uh, furthermore, uh, they have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent new ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Now that's a glasses half full kind of guy, or almost empty kind of guy. You see, people during the days of the Apostle Paul are exactly the way they are today. People that during the days of Jacob are exactly the way they are today. Why? Because we all have a sin nature. We have original sin that haunts us, that uh, besets us, that trips us up all the time. We are broken people that make up a broken society. It's no wonder we elect broken people to govern over us. Even after 4,000 years, people are uh, exactly like they were during the days of Jacob. People are the same. They haven't changed. Nothing has changed. I mean, it's, sure, we have much better weapons. You remember when Esau was, was told, take your weapons, your arrows, your, your bow and your quiver, and go out and hunt game for your father. So he goes out to hunt game. Today, if you're going to go hunting, you're liable to take a uh, uh, Remington 30-06 bolt-action rifle with a scope and a, and a laser sight. That would help you go hunting. Uh, but even if you did want to use a bow and arrow, you'd probably use a compound bow with the carbon fiber reinforced plastic arrows. So we do have much better weapons than they did in those days. In those days, was, uh, the days of the patriarchs was the Bronze Age, when they combined uh, bronze or copper alloys to make their tools and their weapons. Today, we have much better things. But we also have much better toys. You know, I, uh, this is the part I like. We have much better toys. I can, you know, I w often wonder about these people that are uh, graduates of MIT. Brilliant people. Computer whizzes and, and uh, uh, electronic engineers. Then they go to work for companies that make electronic gadgets for us to play with. Like, you know, you have this little box on your... A desk, and you say, Alexa, what is the atomic weight of cobalt? And the little box responds, the atomic weight of cobalt is 58.933. So you, so, you know, you say, Alexa, order a pizza. And you get this pizza. Or you say, Alexa, call me an ambulance. And it says, okay, you're an ambulance. <laughs> the, uh, the, we have such good toys. But human nature is the same. We have better weapons, we have better toys, but people are basically the same as they were 4,000 years ago. People still have um, uh, anger, they still have uh, destructive behavior, they still have envy, they still have deceit. Uh, sometimes they're bitter, sometimes they're angry. Uh, people still fall in love and they have hopes and dreams. People still have successful relationships, and people have failed relationships. That's right. People today still have relationship problems. Does that surprise anybody? And, and the Bible has a word for every relationship problem, including problems with blended families. And Jacob was the head, head of a household that could only be described as a blended family. His home was kind of like a reality TV show. Leah hated Rachel. Rachel was jealous of Leah. The other two women were just sleeping with somebody else's husband. 
So it's just like, you know, his name is Jacob Kardashian or something. <laughs> I'm not saying that conflict is always a bad thing, though. Conflict can be a very good thing. Scott Peck once wrote, you know, the road less traveled. Scott Peck wrote, uh, intimacy is only arrived at through the tunnel of conflict. So some conflict is beneficial. It's how we grow together, depending on how you handle the conflict. But the kind of conflict we find in Genesis chapter 29 and 30 is destructive. It's unhealthy conflict. And to that end, I have uh, three questions that I'd like us to, to discuss for seven minutes and 23 seconds. I've got it timed on my timer, so here we go. Are they up there? Okay. Thank you. 
<laughs> oh, you created your own questions. Right. Right, right. Yeah. Well, Connie happened to yeah, Connie happened to mention that uh, that uh, in the Muslim world you're allowed to marry four women. Which, but in order to do that, you if you buy one a house, you have to buy four houses. One for each wife. If you buy a car for one, you have to buy four cars, one for each drive, wife. Yes, they can't drive. <laughs> they can drive around in their complex in their own yards. That's right. <laughs> if you have three properties, you have to buy a house for each property. Okay, let's take a look at the passage of Scripture. This is the uh, contemporary English version I like this version for several reasons I'll show you in just a minute. Um, the, the Lord knew that Jacob loved Rachel more than he did Leah. Uh, and so he gave children to Leah, but not to Rachel. Leah gave birth to a son and named him Reuben, because she said, The Lord has taken away my sorrow. Now my husband will love me more than he does Rachel. Oh, yeah, Genesis chapter 29, verse 31. Is that? It's in, the, it's in the, the, the contemporary English version, which is slightly different from what you might have. And I'll tell you why I like this version in a minute. Verse, I don't know what verse it is. The Lord uh, has taken away my sorrow. Now my husband will love me more than he does Rachel. Uh, she had a second son and named him Simeon because she said, the Lord has heard that my husband does not love me. When Leah's third son was born, she said, now that my husband will hold me close. So this son she named Levi. She had one more son and named him Judah because she said, I'll praise the Lord. This is uh, what I take from all of this. Leah is having sex with him 
and bearing him children in the hope that he will come to love her. That it would cause him to begin to love her and the love would grow. Because every child she has, she makes that claim perfectly clear. Now my husband will love me. The Lord heard that my husband doesn't love me. My husband will now hold me close. And finally she just gives up and says, well, I'll praise the Lord. She's having sex and bearing children with the hope that her husband will begin to love her. Consider this. Think about our own society. Uh, consider this. Even though Jacob, being a dirty, rotten, no good scoundrel that he was, doesn't love Leah, he is quite willing to have sex with her. Okay, yeah, we're going to talk about sex here. And we'll move right past it, all right? Uh, I observe, and in all of this, I observe that when uh, a relationship begins to fade, in our society, of kind of, I'm an observer. That's what philosophy is. Philosophy is observing the world around you. Uh, I observe that in our society, relationships begin to fade, and a woman might think, if I get pregnant, he'll stay. I'm not sure how that's supposed to work. But broken people think broken thoughts and then make broken decisions based on those thoughts. For example, a couple might say, well, we love each other, so let's move in together. And they do this you know, as a kind of a trial period, and then they want to get married after that. Then the relationship starts to wind down, so they think, well, let's get married. And they have a celebration and they... Uh, in the wedding ceremony and everything, they get married. Then the flame begins to die down in that relationship, so they think, well, let's have a baby. That'll re revive our relationship. I have some statistics for you about marriage. You want to hear them? No. Say, let's hear them, Dr. Mendoza. Okay. This, now, by the way, this is something that they should have told you in the eighth grade, all right? So I'm going to tell you these statistics. First, uh, you're probably aware that uh, 40 to 50 percent of all marriages end in divorce. That's pretty high. But if you live together before you get married, your chances of getting divorced actually increase by 33 percent. I know this might be too late to, for you to hear, but I'm going to give you this last little bit of, of statistics. And uh, this is something that they, again, should have told you in the eighth grade. But if you want to have a good shot at having your marriage last for a lifetime, okay, hold on to yourselves, because this is, this, this is something they should have told you already. And I know it might be a little too late. But if you are a virgin and you marry a virgin, then you go to worship together in a church, a synagogue, or temple, the odds of you getting a divorce, the divorce rate is 1 out of 1,023. Okay, the whole percentages on that would be 0.10%. Not 40%, not 60%, 0.10%. How's that? <laughs> so, and you know, I, I tell you this, even though you should have known this by, in the eighth grade, I'll let you know this, Let's uh, take a look at Leah's uh, life, uh, what Leah has done again. Leah had sex with Jacob and bore children in the hopes of patching up a broken relationship. She's hoping that Jacob will love her more than he does Rachel. It's difficult to say what Jacob's motive is in all of this, but I believe that it proves the old saying that women need a reason to have sex. Men just need a place. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> this is something that I've suspected for a long time. She is having sex with him to, to get him to pull him into a love relationship. Genesis chapter 30, verse 1 through 8 in the uh, contemporary English version again. Let's look at this. Rachel was very jealous of Leah for having children. So now we see that uh, 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 Leah has already has this broken relationship with, his, with her sister. Now we see Rachel is very, very jealous of Leah for having children. And she said to Jacob, I'll die if you don't give me some children. But Jacob became upset with Rachel and answered, Don't blame me. I'm not God. Dirty, rotten scoundrel that he is. Here, take my servant Bilhah, Rachel said, or Rachel told him, uh, have children by her, and I'll let them be born on my knee to show that they're mine. Then uh, Rachel let Jacob marry Bilhah, and they had a son. Rachel named him Dan, because she said, God has answered my prayers. He has judged between me, he's judged me and given me a son. When Bilhah and Jacob had a second son, Rachel said, I've struggled hard with my sister, and I've won. So she named that boy Naphtali. When Leah realized she could not have any more children, she let Jacob marry her servant, Zilpah. And they had a son. I'm really lucky, Leah said. And she named the boy Gad. When they had another son, Leah exclaimed, I'm happy now, and all the women will say how happy I am. I guess you're right. Women do compare themselves in uh, things like this because she's comparing herself with uh, all the other women, saying all the other women will now think I'm happy. So she named him Asher. Now, in this passage of Scripture, I have three observations. The first one is that uh, although the... Contemporary English version says that he, they married that he married Bilhah and Zilpah. He didn't marry them. They were concubine. They were the servants of his wives that he just kept as live-in girlfriends. Now, some of most of you know that occasionally I go out to sea and teach enlisted men and women on board Navy ships, right? And uh, most of you also know that I, I sometimes have a spiritual gift for being insensitive. So, so uh, when I'm teaching this, I come to a point of, uh, of discussion on concubine, on being a concubine, and I tell my, my students this. I say, if you're a man in this class and you are living with a woman that you're not married to, you have a concubine. And I tell the women, if you are a woman in my class and you're living with a man you're not, you're, that you're not married to, you are a concubine. Nothing has changed in 4,000 years. And of course, they don't really take that very well. I don't know why it is I keep getting really positive reviews at the end of the class, though. I guess it's because they hear stuff that they've never heard before. But... A uh, concubine is nothing more than a someone that he has as a possession that he lives with and has sex with. The second observation I have is that uh, you have three generations of patriarchs, and still they haven't learned the lessons. Wait for the Lord's timing, and don't try to solve the problems outside of his will. That seems like it goes in the no-duh file. Wait for the Lord's timing and don't do stuff outside of his will. 
it seems like that would make sense to, to just about anybody. It reminds me of the a verse in Deuteronomy chapter 7 when Moses tells the people, well, God didn't choose you because you were the greatest of all the people. He chose you because you were the weakest. And uh, I can just see God up in heaven, you know, going say, telling the angels, you know, I'm choosing the people of Israel, not because they're great or they're strong, but because of all the people in the world. They are the most stiff-necked, hard-headed, stubborn people I could find. And if I can make something out of them, I can make something out of anybody. Because think about this, the, the people of Israel. They are worshiping the living God, the only true God creator of the universe. And they have seen him do miracle after miracle and great works among them. And every time they turn around, they're worshiping idols of stone and wood. That's a stubborn people. And it's not until uh, 1,500 years later when they're in the Babylonian captivity, when Jerusalem is destroyed and... Uh, the temple is demolished, and the people are taken away captive, that they learn the lesson. Because after the Babylonian captivity, they never again go back into idolatry. It becomes an abomination of desolation when somebody desecrates the temple in idolatry. You see? They finally learned the lesson after 1,500 years, but they're no different than us. I mean, today, we are also stubborn, hard-headed, stiff-necked people. I know this is a kind of a downer, but that's who we are. How many times has God proved himself in your life? How many times has God shown miracles throughout history? And we worship the living God, and yet we continually fall into destructive behavior. But I digress. I don't want to get into too deep into the uh, uh, negative stuff, even though there's a lot of negative things happening in this passage of Scripture. My third observation is that all this conflict and turmoil between the adults has got to have an impact on the children. There's no way they could get out of it. So they end up with 13 children, right? Twelve uh, sons and one daughter. What's the name of the daughter? In uh, Jacob's, Jacob's daughter. Who? Dinah, yeah. Someone's in the kitchen with Dinah. Uh, so uh, they have conflicts that has to impact these children, especially because the children are... Uh, 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 named after the problems in their relationship. It kind of reminds me of a 1979 Arnold Schwarzenegger movie called The Villain. Anybody seen The Villain? See, try to find it on Netflix. The, the villain, Arnold Schwarzenegger, plays a cowboy who, yes, that's right, Yes, and uh, and uh, Anne Margaret, Anne Margaret, he's the good guy, and Anne Margaret is the heroine, and Anne Margaret asks him, "What is your name?" And he says, he says to her, he says, "My name is Handsome Stranger. I was named after my father." So, <laughs> but see, can you imagine having that kind of a name all your life, named after the the uh, struggle between your mother and Rachel? or Rachel, uh, your mother, and Leah, that would cause problems for the rest of your life. And these, these uh, uh, 12 sons grow up to be not exactly the most noble of people. You know, they, they take Jacob, and I mean, they take Joseph and want to kill him, and they sell him into slavery. They go, and because their, their daughter is, uh, their sister is... Uh, uh, raped by some guy in another village, rather than f coming on doing a full-on uh, army attack on the village, 
they go through at night and murder all the men in the village by trickery. You know that story, right? Anyway, we'll probably get to it here pretty soon. But can you imagine being named after the difficulty that your parents had in, broken, in a broken relationship? These are broken people in broken relationships. It's a good thing that we worship a God of forgiveness and mercy and healing. Anybody say amen to that? <laughs> it's a good thing we worship a God of forgiveness, mercy, and healing. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 says, Stop being bitter and angry and mad at others. Don't yell. Oh, and I should stop yelling myself. <laughs> Don't yell at one another or curse each other or ever be rude. Instead, be kind and merciful and forgive others just as God forgave you because of Christ. Amen. All right, let's move on to Genesis chapter 30, verse 14 through 18. During the time of the harvest, this is the reason why I, I like this particular translation, by the way. During the time of the harvest, Reuben found some love flowers and took them to his mother, Leah. Rachel asked Leah for some of them, but Leah said, It's bad enough that you've stolen my husband. Now you want my son's love flowers, too. All right, Rachel answered. Let me have the flowers, and you can sleep with, my, with Jacob tonight. And that evening, when Jacob came home from the fields, Leah told him, You're sleeping with me tonight. I've hired you with my son's flowers, love flowers. And they slept together that night, and God answered Leah's prayer and gave her a fifth son. Leah shouted, God has rewarded me for letting Jacob marry my servant. And she named the boy Issachar. Okay, so I love that, that way, love flowers, that term love flowers. Some of you might have in your translation mandrakes or nightshades. Some have even uh, magic fruit or love apples. They're, they're, uh, it's a plant that's rare in Canaan. But it's all over the place in Arabia. In fact, in Arabia, they called it the devil's apple. And that shows you the difference in, in uh, thinking about, about sex between the... Never mind. <laughs> they are, they're, they're, these plants are used as an aphrodisiac. And they have some sort of hallucinogenic properties. And especially used with superstition... And they were held that they, it was held that they could uh, cause fertility. So this was all about using a plant to cause the fertility. Rachel herself has not borne any children. Leah has become temporarily infertile. So both women were seeking the mandrake or love flower to use as is in their superstition, rather than trusting in God's blessings. Once again, the, these are broken people with broken relationships, having broken actions. Leah and Rachel are both showing superstition by putting their hope in plants outside of God's will. Finally, uh, like I said before, I have been sometimes accused, I don't know why, of being insensitive. Uh, and uh, some people might be thinking, well, Mike's been talking an awful lot about the women in this family. What about Jacob? I do have a word to say about Jacob. Uh, would you like to hear it? Yeah, mic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, come back next week. Uh, I do have a word to say about Jacob. Jacob was a dirty, rotten, no-good scoundrel. 
That's, yeah. No, that's not what God said. That's my opinion of Jacob in this uh, particular situation. Um, now, I don't know whether he was just too busy amassing a great wealth, which a lot of men are in our society today. They're too busy with their careers. And even women are involved in their careers. Uh, too busy doing that uh, to pay any attention to what's going on in their home. Or maybe they're just too busy watching sports on television to pay attention to what's going on in their homes. But I lay much of the blame for the brokenness of their family square on the shoulders of Jacob. Now, each of the wives have to take personal responsibility for their own actions. But much of the blame for the continued brokenness of the family is squarely on the shoulders of Jacob, the dirty, rotten, no-good scoundrel. And you see, we live in a broken world made up of broken nations that have broken states and have broken counties with broken neighborhoods that are made up of broken homes filled with broken people. And the first step to healing the brokenness in our world is for men to start taking their responsibilities as godly leaders seriously in their families. If Jacob would have been a godly leader in his family that his family needed, he could have resolved much of the conflicts in his family by leading them to the throne of God. So, in conclusion, I can say this. Jacob's family is a broken family, and Jacob was a dirty, rotten, no-good scoundrel. But... God still blessed them. And God could still use that family, even in their brokenness. That's the good news. But you know what the great news is? The great news is we don't have to stay broken. Because Jesus died on the cross at Calvary to heal broken hearts, to heal broken relationships. The great news is that we don't have to stay broken. God wants to heal broken hearts. God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross. And Psalm 147 verse 3 says, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Isaiah 61 verse 1, He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. God sent his son to heal broken hearts. Now, this is what we celebrate when we do the Lord's Supper. We celebrate the fact that Jesus came and his body was broken so that our hearts could be healed. Leave behind your grip.